Welcome to You Ought to Know Chat, a special edition today with Eric Enga, CEO of Stone Temple Consulting, who also happens to be one of my very best friends, who also happens to be my boss. Uh, founder and CEO of Stone Temple Consulting, Eric Enga is also the principal lead author of the co-author of The Art of SEO, now out in its third edition. Uh, which I see him scurrying here on the video chat to find find a copy of. I'm sure he has a copy of that book somewhere. There it is. Uh, the Art of SEO, third edition, almost a thousand pages, um, probably the definitive guide in print right now to <laughs> SEO. But we're here today to talk with Eric about a study that he published just today on the stonetemple.com blog. You can find that if you're listening by audio at www.stonetemple.com slash blog. And the first post up there this week will be the definitive guide to Google Rich Answers, which uh, starts out, although it is a definitive guide, and we'll get into that moment, starts out with some breaking news. Uh, so, Eric, go ahead and, and share that news with us. What did you find out recently that you're sharing with the world today? So, I mean, I think uh, the big thing is we get a really good measurement of just how much Google has expanded their Rich Answers. Um, so just for the background for everybody, in February, we published a study that, looking at a very similar data set uh, at 855,000 queries to figure out how many of those Google responded to with a rich answer. Well, what we published today is a repeat of that. We actually did more queries, but the data I published today was a comparison of the exact same 855,000 queries with the goal of assessing just how much progress Google has made. And if I look at that in a pure apples to apples sense, we went from them uh, responding to about 22% of the queries with a rich answer to uh, about 31% of the queries or about a 40% increase, which you gotta keep in mind, this is uh, actually uh, across the seven month or so time period that's not a lot of time. So they are pushing very hard and very fast in terms of what they're doing uh, with their rich answers. Yeah, it's really when you take that perspective, when you look at that, that's a percentage of, you know, again, over 800,000 queries that you tested. Uh, that is an amazing growth uh, over just six, seven months. Uh, perhaps we should back up for just a moment for anyone that might not know uh, what that term means, a rich answer. So, Eric, what, what is a rich answer in Google search? Yeah, so if you type a query like how to reset iPhone, uh, you get uh, above the normal links uh, for your search results, you get a, uh, uh, a box which gives you kind of a direct answer to the question and outlines the steps to how to reset your iPhone. Or you could ask uh, how many quarts there are in a gallon and then Google will come back and tell you it's that many in case you didn't know. Um, uh, and, you know, things like that. Uh, there's so many different queries they respond to now. What is the GDP of the USA? How tall is the Empire State Building? Uh, these are all good examples of, of queries. Um, it's kind of fun if you do it with one of these devices. Let's just do this for fun. And for people uh, who are listening by audio, one of these devices is a mobile smartphone. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, um, and I'll, I'll be careful to hold it next to my microphone when I, uh, oh, that's what I get for not unplugging my phone. Uh, all, all, kinds of, all kinds of sound effects and audio delights being added to the, to the show today. Yeah, so sorry about that, folks. It'll stop in a second, and I will get it unplugged here. Uh, I'm such a bad guest for these things, Mark. Um, that's all right. That's what, that's what the editing software is for. Uh, yes, yeah, so there you go. Uh, so hang on. I'm going to get an example for everybody. Uh, okay. All right. So uh, how tall is the Empire State Building? Takes a moment. Hang on. Come on, Google. You can do it. The Empire State Building is 1,250 feet tall. Did you hear that out there? Yes, we did. We did loud and clear, and, and I'll take their word for it. I mean, it is Google after all. And that's what it looks like, uh, the, the response. Mm -hmm. So you see at the beginning, there's a map here. And sorry if it's a little vague for you all. Uh, and then it says how tall it is, uh, 1,250 feet. But if you go to the tip, you know, past the actual building space, it's 1,454. So 
they're fairly thorough in their answer. So those are examples of rich answers. So great. So rich answers is basically Google attempting to answer our questions right in the search results without us not without us not. That's a hard sentence to say. We don't necessarily have to uh, click on a search result to go see the answer as we would have uh, just a year or more ago. But now many more of these answers, as you said today, increasing in our test query set of over 800,000 queries went from uh, December of 2014 to, to July of 2015 from about, what was it, 22 to 31 percent of the queries? Was that That's the, right. The, and, okay. and to be clear, that was a very strict apples to apples comparison. Uh, if you go back and look at the original study um, uh, and, and the new one today, um, you have to make sure, we had to make sure we were very careful to do comparison in a direct head-to-head -head, uh, way. Right. Um, so we were very careful about that. But I want to give you a little more perspective. Keep yeah, in mind that two years ago, the answer, what we would have done, or what we would have found if we did this study would have been 0%. So they've gone from 0 to 31% in, uh, you know, two years. So that they're heading, uh, making progress at a breakneck pace. Now, Eric, uh, you uh, found a number of other things in this data that were interesting, uh, particularly in some of the types of searches or excuse me rich answers that google is showing is a greater variety right than uh yes. than before even than six months ago and some are growing some are decreasing uh without going into all the detail can you share just a few of those insights yeah no happy to do that uh so um there are many different kinds of results so uh an example is uh, uh a carousel result which is uh uh you know where you get a kind of a black bar across the top of the search results uh, showing a whole array of different uh, answers like uh, uh, you know what's the uh, uh, who are the players on the Boston Red Sox uh, uh, is one that might bring up a result like that or you can get it if you play around with building heights uh, uh, if I had followed up my query on the Empire State Building by asking uh, about the height of uh, One World Trade Center uh, then it would have given me kind of a carousel result across the top. And those increased significantly um, uh, for, for Google. Uh, some others, uh, um, uh, Google answers where they provide no attribution to a third party. And before you rush off and think that Google is stealing content from people, the reason why that's happened is Google has extended its knowledge of public domain data where no attribution is due. Uh, and so very important point there, uh, make sure you're not building your SEO strategy around a goal of getting uh, traffic uh, from Google on, on public domain data, because that's something they're gonna aim to publish. Uh, let's see, results with tabs went up. So menus kinds of things. If you ask for, um, you know, the, uh, uh, menu for a local restaurant. One that I did here was uh, Stir Crazy Menu, which was one in uh, Pocasset, Massachusetts. Uh, we'll bring up uh, kind of a tabbed result. So a bunch of different things kind of uh, uh, went up. And the reason why that's interesting to look at is you can see what formats Google thinks are successful uh, because they're expanding on them. And that's one of the reasons why we dug into to all of that. Terrific. Now, I want to move on, Eric, before we uh, open up a seat here and bring in some people that want, want to ask you questions directly to the question that's on a lot of people's minds. In fact, I think it's Peter Lund in, in the text chat here on Blab already raised it. Uh, isn't this concerning for site owners? Uh, if a lot of these results, not all of them, as you noted, but a lot of them are uh, Google grabbing information from third party websites and putting it there in the answer box. So there you got your answer, you're all done. You don't need to go to the website. Uh, isn't this bad news for site owners? Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and a uh, couple of things. First of all, uh, in the study or in the guide, we, we published a, a couple of case studies of people who got rich answers. Uh, and in both cases, they saw their traffic increase. So one uh, was for a site called Steady Demand, 
uh, run by a guy called Ben Fisher. Uh, and they got uh, uh, a rich answer box for how to get more followers on Google+. Plus. And if you search on that, they actually still have that rich answer box. And their traffic, if you look at it, is kind of humming along. And then when they get the rich answer, it took a big, steep jump up uh, on that particular web page, to be clear. Uh, mm -hmm. They got the rich answer. So for them, it was a big boon for traffic. Uh, another example was from a, a company called Confluent Forms. Uh, and the person that both Mark and I know over there is a guy called David Kutcher. Uh, and they got uh, um, a rich answer for what is a RFP, uh, that particular query. Uh, and then later they lost it uh, to Wikipedia, sadly. But what happened there is their traffic was humming along and then took a steep leap up when they got it. And then when they lost it, it dropped back down again. So those are two case studies where it was clearly very good for the website to get uh, a rich answer result. Now, why, but, if they, okay, I just want to ask you, Eric, if they're getting the, uh, the answers being given in the rich answer box by Google, how is that driving traffic to their sites? Why are they getting, still getting traffic by getting more traffic? Yeah, uh, so the, the answer to the question is that their page uh, and the way uh, Google portrayed their results in the what they call the featured snippet when it's taken from a third-party website um, um, in a way that would entice a user to click through. So in the case of the what is ARFP result, it followed up with uh, the, sort of the title of that said, what is ARFP, uh, how to find RFPs, and are RFPs still relevant? So the way that title was written, it made it clear that there was more information on the page than the direct answer to the question. And here's the subtlety uh, that it's really important to understand. When a user is asked a simple question, right, uh, like what is an RFP uh, or how to get more followers on Google Plus, it is really rare that that's the only question they have related to that topic on, in, in mind. And so, what um, uh, this situation did in the case of Confluent Forms um, is because the description made it clear there was more information, people would get an, uh, an answer to the question, what's an RFP? But then they'd say, oh, I can get more info. And they'd click through to the site that Google had just apparently declared to be authoritative on the topic to get the rest of that info. So the click-through rate goes way up. Now, let's be fair about this. It is certainly possible, and there certainly are cases where there are people who are losing traffic because the question is maybe something that does not tend to have follow on uh, things that people may be researching, or the way their featured snippet is presented doesn't um, uh, make it clear to the user looking at it that there's more to be answered. Um, so that's. Um, uh, there's definitely those kinds of cases. I can tell you from the conversations that you and I, Mark, have had with Google about this, that Google believes that publishers still benefit in the broader sense of things because of the branding value that they get and uh, the, the tendency to increase click-through rates on other situations where people encounter them in the search results. Um, I don't have a way to measure that. We don't have a way to measure that, but I do know that Google believes that to be true. Yeah. So uh, we're getting a, getting a question here from uh, from Gary Simmons in the chat uh, that I think is interesting. Just talking about Wikipedia, and I know that we didn't uh, we didn't separate out Wikipedia data in this particular study, but uh, but you looked at a lot of these results by hand, Eric. Uh, obviously, you couldn't look at all of them, but you looked at tons of them. Just observationally, uh, what is your your thoughts about how much of this, because in the beginning, when these first were coming out, they were clearly dominated by Wikipedia. That was the easy get for Google, right? To go get the answers from Wikipedia. Um, is it still the case that Wikipedia is dominating these? Well, I mean, Wikipedia gets a lot. And as, as, as a single domain, they get more than anybody else. There's no doubt that that's true. But this does lead into another important part of the study. Um, so, 54% of the domains that we found Google using had a domain authority of 60 or less. 
So, and we even found some domains with a domain authority of less than 20 that uh, uh, Google used for rich answers. So, um, you shouldn't, uh, well, we don't believe that there's any connection between authority and getting the rich answer. We believe it's all about an information quality analysis that Google does. Uh, and that's uh, uh, the key uh, to this. Great. I'm going to, uh, Eric, just let me ask you just uh, just to respect your time here. Uh, do you have a hard stop at the top of the hour? For your, your uh, I do. I can run about five minutes late. Unfortunately, that's the best I'm going to be able to do. Okay, good. So good to know. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring in uh, Michelle Stinson Ross here uh, to ask a question. Hey, Michelle. Uh, hey, guys. Hi. Um, I. This makes me think because I, I'm part of the team at Authority Labs. One of the things that we do is track rankings, particularly um, organic rankings, um, local rankings, that kind of stuff. And uh -huh. I have to wonder, is number one, is this something that we need to start tracking? Number two, is it going to really stick around because Google rolls out stuff and then goes, yeah, this really isn't working for us and they roll it back? Um, is this something that you think is going to stick around long enough that we need to adjust a SEO strategy for? I, I would personally. Uh, I, I, I do think that uh, Google is down the path with this and they're not coming back. Okay. Um, it fits very well in with the vision that uh, Mitt Singel has uh, spoken about for years of Google's mission is to build that Star Trek computer a conversational computer where you can get the answer to really any question you want. Uh, and so I don't, I don't think they're coming back from this. They're, they're going down the path and, and I would uh, track it because um, uh, it, it does impact the click through rates of the rest of the results. Okay. It, whatever's in that rich answer spot, he's going to get the lion's share of the clicks. And it's, you know, the, we've all seen the old numbers, Michelle, I know you've seen them. It's like, the old AOL number is said 44% to position one and 20% to position two for click through mm -hmm. rates. And then later studies aren't quite so skewed, but it's still 30% to position one and a big number to position two and so forth. Well, unfortunately, when there's a rich answer box on top of the normal results, all of those numbers drop. That's uh, what our uh, uh, anecdotal data uh, is is telling us at this point. Well, and I think Will Reynolds also alluded to that in his keynote at PubCon that they're finding that even though you've done a great job and you're ranking one or two organically, that click through rate has historically gone down because there is so much more. I mean, we've got um, right. local, we've got the local pack ahead of um, organic placement. We've got, you know, all kinds of other, not just rich answers, but what you were talking about earlier with, you know, the other types of uh, carousels and things. There's so much more happening before you ever get to an organic position that, yeah, I really have to wonder what are we going to have to do now to get super organic placement? Yeah, well, and, and you know, I, I like the, uh, the term because, uh, you know, think about it. This is a new opportunity to, to optimize for super organic placement. Uh, and it's not an authority-based algorithm. Gosh, if I'm like sit back and try to be smart about how I could uh, create content that uh, Google might use there, then I'm gonna sort of jump ahead of that traditional authority-based algorithm uh, and, uh, uh, and really create some interesting results for myself. So um, I think it's very cool. And we actually did a test, which is what's at the, the end of the, uh, the guide that we published today, where we went out and created five pages to try and generate rich answers. And we, we got two of them worked. So oh, wow. Okay. That's right. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't call it a perfect formula because it wasn't 100%. <laughs> but uh, I'll take 40%, you know, because... Sure. Uh, you know, if I uh, uh, and we're we're gradually doing a little bit more stuff. Oh, I got Brent Satoris here. 
my dark hat is itching. Of course it is, Brad. Uh, so, um, Brent, you know, you know that is posted in public, Brent. I just want to remind you. That it's in public <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a kind of a cool new opportunity to do some new stuff just by right. doing really good content so, optimization. Is this the impetus for um, content creators to look back at their frequently asked questions and go, okay, how can I really rock the socks off of that? It, it is. And uh, uh, the guide does end with a uh, uh, sort of a, 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 well, we kind of lay out what we did in our test and the steps we went through. And then we leave behind at the end a four-step process, which is you start with these really commonly asked questions that people uh, ask in your space and you make a list of those. Uh, you create some uh, uh, great content around that. Uh, so yes, you directly answer the question, but then you put some companion content around it to give it more depth while still making sure the direct answer to the question is easily found by both users and search engines in the, mm -hmm. in the source. And then uh, you make sure that Google discovers that um, I'm simplifying it for purposes of the, the show, but um, okay. that's that's what we did, and it actually works uh, appears to work pretty well. Cool. So I, I I'm full of questions. Mark, stop me if if you need to <laughs> make no, me shut up. Is, nobody else is popping in. Let me just bring in a uh, bring in a question though from uh, from Grant Simmons uh, in the chat. It's, it's a very specific question, but an interesting one. Because uh, Eric, one of the things that you saw in the in the new study was that. Uh, I believe I'm correct in this, that the number of, um, of rich answers that had a title uh, increased, but not all rich answers get a title. Have, not all of them have that format of the box starting with a title. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Grant was asking, uh, from your observations, did the title in the, um, uh, in the, real, the rich answer mimic the page title? Uh, there was the, the assigned page title the webmaster gave the page, or was Google rewriting those titles to a large extent? So uh, I don't have a statistical uh, analysis of what percentage of the time Google um, uh, um, edited the title, but there was definitely evidence that they were making changes to titles. Yes, it does. And, and I still, do have to note that Brent here is saying he meant deep blue, not, not yeah, dark. Yeah, yeah, not dark, of course not. Yeah, we mean it. Sure <laughs> uh, thing, Brent. Uh, I, I believe you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's going he's gonna to come and we'll give him a chance to defend himself. Michelle, I'm going to drop you out at this point. Thank you so much for, for coming in and joining us on this chat today. Cool. Thanks, Thanks for, for giving me the Thank opportunity. You. Yep. Okay. Hey, I don't see any hat at all there, Brent. Yeah, I, you know, the, I don't have the hair for it. It keeps falling see, it's, off. See, yeah. see, Google, Brent is white and shiny. There you go. Uh, you know, so I, um, I, I do have a question, though. It's something that kind of the first thing that popped in my head is, you know, exact match pages, you know, location-based pages. Those became like a, a whole orphaned page kind of initiative for people back in the day. Obviously, Google's gone through a lot to kind of devalue those pages. Um, you know, people listening to this might start thinking, well, well sh you know, I'm crap. I'm going to start, you know, creating a bunch yeah. of pages with answers, doing it again. How are how do you think you think Google's going to kind of have a, a way of identifying that and combat? that should people kind of avoid that how much is too much yeah you know the, what, what I do know is that this is really highly about content quality analysis uh, and I think if they're going to come back out with say a whole bunch of location pages that are that are thin in content uh, I think that's something that Google's already thought about uh, maybe people can figure a way out of it, but uh, around it. But I think they're going to really be trying to to screen that kind of stuff out. Well, have we? Ha have you been able? Because one way I see around it right away is through like blogger outreach, right? So identifying through your study which sources are being picked up more for the answers, finding an authoritative source, building a relationship with them, allowing you to go in and write answers to questions on authoritative source where you can write yourself into the answer in some way shape or form or brand yourself through the answer in some way shape or form might be an interesting way of approaching it too yeah it, it might be but I th at least at this point we don't think that the authority of the source site is a factor in getting picked for a rich answer so this is what I, uh, to me makes me so excited about this is that uh uh you know even with relatively low authority sites 
you can get one of these for yourself. So the, the two case studies I mentioned earlier in this lab, um, one of them was a, a domain authority 47 and the other was a 38. So they weren't particularly authoritative, but they were able to get the rich answer results for themselves. Um, and Do you think I, this does this lead to the potential, you know, of Google looking at different authoritative signals? Um, you know, maybe well, looking they, at a different... Yeah, I think they are, at least for this algorithm. They actively are weighting um, some sort of content quality analysis in a way that's different than what they're doing in the rest of their algorithm. So that, that's, that's significant. Really different. That's significant, Eric, what you just said, is that it might be a content quality analysis rather than a link authority analysis. And, yeah. And, yeah, and just to be clear, we know that Google is doing content quality analysis in their core algorithm. But what I'm saying here is they're doing a different kind of content quality analysis in this algorithm, and it is clearly a separate algorithm. Well, you um, would have to also think that time on page and and people, you know, going back to the search engine, you know, would be major factors in this as well, right? Yeah, it is, and that brings out a different point, uh, uh, Brent, which is that um, we know that Google is testing. So what they do is they will run a, uh, they'll put a rich answer box up above the results, just like that's above my head at the moment. Um, so they'll do that. And then based on what's happening, they may pull it down. So they are measuring some sort of user engagement metrics with that. And you'll see them put one up and then they'll say, okay, got that data. Then they'll try a different one. Uh, and then they might take them both down or they might go back to the first one. So they have built in some sort of iterative testing uh, algorithm in here too. There's really clear indication that that's part of what's going on. Do you see a path for being able to, I mean, obviously when you were doing this study, you were looking at ways of, of running the queries. Um, is, is there a potential for people to run queries looking for you know, negatives, like run a, a variety of questions looking for no answers that are currently being resulted so that they can start focusing on that area? Uh, yeah, um, I, I would imagine that most people won't uh, do what we did, which is look at 1.4 million results. Uh, um, so they probably won't go that far. But I mean, you could do this by hand, right? It's like if you've decided you wanted to rank for, you know, ten, get rich answer boxes, I should say, for 10 commonly asked questions, right? Uh, you know, picking up on what Michelle was talking about. Uh, if you wanted to rank for 10 commonly asked questions, you, you would, of course, go enter those in in the search results, and you'd see whether or not someone was currently there. Um, and it's kind of interesting. It's a little different to try to rank for something that nothing currently has a rich answer box for versus trying to displace someone. I don't have enough data to tell you the difference. I'll tell you the two examples where we were able to generate a rich answer box. There was no competition currently. So we got ranked on things that how to implement a no follow and how to implement a no index, uh, which demonstrates, which demonstrates that uh, these things are are fluid and that if Google finds an answer to something that people are asking, actually asking in search, uh, that's you know whereas maybe before there was just no web page out there that was giving a good enough answer to that, they'll create an answer box for it. Yeah, this might have been in the study, but did you see um, what was the percentage of no answers? Well, yeah, uh, of the 855,000 questions that we published the results of today, um, uh, to compare with the earlier study, it was 31.2% of the time. And all the questions that we used were designed in a way where we thought there was a chance that they would come up with a rich answer. So did you publish the, the questions that had no answer by chance? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, sadly, no. Uh, we, uh, yeah, we, we are keeping that data internally at this point. And gotcha. just for, for clarity, uh, we, uh, we actually did a full 1.4 million queries. So there's actually a half a million queries that we didn't even publish the data on. Not that it's directionally different from what we saw, uh, but the next time we do a comparison, it'll be 1.4 against 1.4, where we're actually varying the question set to make you it should, much uh, richer. 
you guys should release one question a day, like on social. That way you have like kind of like your little gimme, right? Like every day, yeah. make sure you oh. check in to get your- And we have, we did 150,000 150, <laughs> days of worth of content at least. I don't know, there you go, content right. creator, I love it. Uh, let me bring in, Brent, let me bring in some questions sure. that are being asked in the chat here. And thank you so much for joining us. Great, great questions sure. as we knew would come from you. Uh, yeah. Michelle asked about, Michelle Stinson Ross from Authority Labs uh, asked about any, do we observe any local um, influence since these are on mobile devices that we're seeing a lot of these. Uh, it's not exclusive to mobile, but uh, she said, you know, is there any relation to uh, to local authority or uh, on that that you saw? Um, yeah, so we, we did not see any uh, real indication of local authority here. Um, I'd have to think back and and see if we how many questions we asked to have local intent. And that would be a very fair question to ask. And, and I apologize, I don't know that off the top of my head. I know there were some. Um, um, oh, I, one other thing I want to think be, uh, mm -hmm. uh, mention because it always comes up in these discussions with people. I get asked about whether or not FAQ pages are a good way to go uh, for uh, trying to generate these kinds of things. And my answer is, I don't think so. We didn't see any evidence of that working for anybody. And a very important part of this, in my opinion, is not only to directly answer the question, but include a lot of other value added information around that. So that um, you're not simply, you know, uh, you know, how many quarts in a gallon? And then, you know, you put the question, and then you put the number four, and that's your entire web page. Um, that isn't going, to, well, of course, that's a public domain query, so they wouldn't sure. use that anyway. But go with me here for a second. Right. I mean, your page has to have more to it than just a direct answer to that question. That's my experience with it. Google is looking for those things that have a, a, a richer overall experience. Eric, a question that comes up related to that a number of times that I hear from people is, is it necessary or is it even helpful to use uh, uh, structured data, uh, create a schema markup for uh, to get these rich answer boxes? Yeah, uh, no, no indication whatsoever. Uh, the pages we put up, we did not use schema uh, markup. We did that deliberately. We wanted to test that, uh, and uh, yeah, it was not necessary to to right. use that. Um, that doesn't mean that you might not have a better chance of getting every chance if you had one. I don't have a statistical analysis of that to comment on. Uh, but we did not see any case it's necessary. In fact, let me put it to you this way. If there's any part of the Google algorithm that's dependent on schema, uh, they, they would have very barren results. You know, it's just it's not, not enough people are doing it, yeah. right? I know we're down to your, your last couple of minutes here, Eric, and we very much appreciate your time and coming in and sharing us on a very busy day. But um, any Parting words, anything that you'd leave us with on the value of these rich answers or what we should take away from this today? Well, I mean, I think we kind of drew it out a little bit in discussion uh, and I do wanna just emphasize that I do think there's a new optimization opportunity here. And it's, it gives you an opportunity to step back and really think about the quality of your content uh, and whether or not you're answering the big questions that people have, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you know, the bottom of the study, if you go uh, look there, uh, it does kind of lay out the process we went through in our formula uh, that we used. And um, it's a new opportunity. It's a new way to get presence. Oh, and it does, it does remind me, you don't have to be number one in the SERPs currently to get a result. So uh, one of the two sites that I mentioned earlier was actually in position seven. And got a rich answer box above all the results so they were still in position seven but they're also in position one man does that rock right that really um, rocks yeah you know yeah. didn't have to go and get to uh, uh eight to major uh, authoritative sites to link to them from their home page you know screaming that they were the best thing since sliced bread didn't have to go through all that pain just created some really kick-ass content that answered the question directly and they were in good shape it almost seems like, uh, you know, this is something that I've talked about in the past, I call uh, Google behavior modification. Uh, I'm not saying this is intentional on their part, but, you know, Google tends to do things, certainly like with the penalties is the most obvious example, but in positive ways too, that encourage us to do the things that Google has always said they wanted us to do. They want us 
you know, producing it rich content that really helps people and answers their questions and, and you know, get satisfies what they're looking for when they come to Google search. Well, giving sites these kind of rich answers, uh, especially the ones that help the sites out, uh, certainly is a way of acknowledging it, right? It's a way of rewarding people who maybe, you know, aren't as good at playing the SEO game, but they're really great at providing what people want. And Google just pops them right up there to number one. That's that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it is pretty awesome. And I, I do have to comment. I don't think anyone's faster at clicking than uh, Brent Satoris in terms of. <laughs> uh, but we thank you, Brent. Uh, and he's highly competitive, so don't. Uh... <laughs> Listen, Eric, thank you so much. Uh, for folks to know, I am going to stick around for a little while more if people want to chat some more about this. Um, but Eric, thank you so much for joining us, for publishing a study, for all the hard work that went into it, and the Stone Temple team, um, who I certainly appreciate as well as you. Oh, yeah, so, no, a ton uh, of people did a lot of work here. Uh, so I, I got the lucky luck of being the analyst and presenting the results. Uh, I thought there was an awful lot of uh, teamwork involved in putting this together, as you well know, Mark. Terrific. Well, thank you for the value that you've given and, and for sharing this with people live here today and people listening or watching later. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. All right. And if I do finish the thing I'm going to do now early, I'll, I'll rush back, but I don't know when I'll be here. So. Okay.